Hi everybody, welcome to church and also to the last session of our Covenant series. Now this really is the climax of our study because this is the covenant that sealed the entire redemptive plan of God for mankind. Every covenant that we have studied thus far throughout biblical history actually points to this final covenant that came through our Lord Jesus Christ. This climatic covenant is commonly known as the New Covenant, or actually I can also call it the New Testament. The reason is because the word covenant and the word testament is the same word. Now, if you were to take the Bible and then you divide it between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you actually discover that about three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament and one quarter is the New Testament. Now, let me ask you, if you really want to understand what the New Covenant is all about, where do you begin? Actually, some of you may be thinking, yeah, let's begin with the New Testament. But really, that's not the case. I think if you really want to understand what the New Covenant is all about, we need to begin in the Old Testament. Why? Because the New Testament the, or the new covenant is really already promised in the Old Testament. But now it finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. Now we have a saying in Bible study that goes like this. The new is in the old contained. The old is in the new explained. Why? Because the New Testament is already promised in the Old Testament and the Old Testament really begins to make more sense in the New Testament. So in order to understand the New Testament, we must begin really in the Old Testament. Now, the truth is that our Bible is really one unit. Both the Old and the New Testament are equally important and relevant to us today. Actually, somehow... Uh, it's somehow a little bit misleading to actually call it the Old Testament and the New Testament because it can leave the impression that there are only two covenants in the Bible, the Old and the New, which is really not true because we have studied at least six of them. Now, some people think that anything in the Old Testament is considered obsolete and anything in the New Testament is fresh. No, brothers and sisters, the entire Bible is the Word of God, both Old and New Testament. So to understand the New Testament or to understand the New Covenant, we must begin in the Old Testament. So how did the New Covenant come about? Here's a little bit of backdrop. After God established the Davidic Covenant, which we studied last week, the king, uh, after the, the Davidic covenant was established with King David, different kings from the line of David begin to reign in Israel over the next 400 years or more. But because of their sinful nature, many of the kings led the people of God into sin and idolatry. And this finally resulted in the Babylonian captivity. But as the people of God went into captivity, our covenant-keeping God begin to point them to a new era that is coming. Now, what is this new covenant going to be like? What is it like? Now, here are two things I want to share with you. Number one, it is announced in the Old Testament. We need to understand that the new covenant was announced in the Old Testament. The new covenant of Christ was promised in the Old Testament a long time before it was established. The prophet Jeremiah actually told us what the new covenant will be like. And this is recorded for us in Jeremiah 31. Let me read for you from verse 31 to 34. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 onwards. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, and this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it into their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. 
No longer would they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The prophet Jeremiah declared to the people of God that the days are coming when God will make a new covenant with His people. And the, the prophet also said that it will not be like the one he made with their ancestors when they came out of Egypt. So what is this one that they made with their ancestors when they came out of Egypt? It can only be referring to the covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai, which is the Mosaic covenant of the law, which we studied a few weeks ago. Now, this was the covenant that the people of God had broken even though God was married with them at Mount Sinai and became their husband. They became his wife. But yet, Israel broke covenant with the Lord. And therefore, God is now going to make with them a new covenant in relation to this old Mosaic covenant of the law. Now, how will this new covenant be different from the Mosaic Covenant of old. How will it be different? I think it will be different in three ways. Number one, inside versus outside. Look at verse 33 of Jeremiah 31. It says, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This new covenant is different because now the laws will be written not on tablets of stone, but in the hearts and minds of the people. It will be from the inside out rather than outside in. It will not just be, they, they will not just be told how to live from the outside, but they would be given a desire to want to live that way from the inside from the heart, from the inside of them. It is not that they have to live right now, but they want to live right. The old covenant told the people what to do, but never gave them the power to actually do it. Now, we all know that there's nothing wrong with the law. And there's nothing wrong at all with the law. The Ten Commandments and all the 603 other bylaws, they are good. There's nothing wrong with the law, but there's something terribly wrong with men, isn't that, isn't that right? Now, what's wrong with men? In one word, it will be sin. It's because of our sinful nature. We can never keep the laws, no matter how good they are. Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul tell us what the problem is. Romans chapter 7, verse 14, Paul wrote, We know that the law is spiritual. The law is good, but I am unspiritual, Paul said. So as a slave to sin. One of the best ways I can illustrate it would be this. You know, when the sun shines on the ground, what comes out of the, of the soil is are actually weeds, right? Weeds begin to come. Now, the sun is good. The wheat is not good. But, and that's exactly what Paul is saying here. He's saying that the, the sun is like the law is good. But when it shines onto the ground, which is the hearts of man, weeds begin to come forth. So weeds are like sin, See, so the sun is good, but the law, when it shines into man's heart, what comes forth is actually sin. Why? Because the more we are told not to do this and that, the more we end up doing it. Is that true? It's almost like if you walk into my office and there are two files sitting on the table. One file is just a normal file. The other one has the words printed across it, top secret. Which one are you likely to be tempted to look at? The normal file or the file that says top secret? Exactly. The more we are told not to do it, the more we want to do it. It's a sinful nature that is in man. And what Paul is saying is this, there is nothing wrong with the sun or the law, but the problem is that when law begins to shine into man's heart, when the sun begins to shine onto the ground, what comes forth are weeds. Sin begins to be birthed. See, and that's what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with the law, but I am perverted. Man is perverted. The sin nature gets the better of us. So another way to put it is, man is like a bowling ball with a weight on one side. No matter how you try to keep that ball in the lane, it goes into the drain. That's where we miss all the time. Man is like an arrow with a crooked shaft. 
no matter how I aim at the target, it just won't hit it. Man is like a rifle. There is not zero, if you understand what I mean. So no matter how you aim straight, the bullet just go astray. Man has a bias towards sin because of the sin nature that is in us. And this is the dilemma of sin that every one of us face. That's why Paul goes on to say in Romans 7 verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I end up doing. This is the dilemma of sin that man struggles with. And it is the new covenant, my brothers and sisters, that will set us free from sin, from the inside out. And that is why it is not only a new covenant, but it is actually a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, the writer of Hebrews, talking about the new covenant of Christ, says this, But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, referring to the old covenant priest, as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Not only is the new covenant based on better promises, it is also mediated by a better priesthood with Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Now, that's why the new covenant is better than the old, based on better promises, based on the better priesthood. Now, does this mean, therefore, that as a new covenant believer today, you and I can never fail or you and I can never fall into sin ever again? Well, the truth is, I need not live in sin anymore. That's the good news. We now no longer, we are no longer under the law. We're no longer under the master of sin. So you and I need not sin anymore. But we can still fall into sin in a moment of weakness. We can. And then what happened if I do fall into sin? The good news is that I now have a great high priest seated at the right hand of God, making intercessions on my behalf. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit is here now to give me a new heart, a new spirit. My heart of stone can be exchanged for a heart of flesh, you see. And I need not go on sinning anymore. That's the power of the new covenant. But if I do fall, what I need to do is to put my faith in my great high priest who is seated on a throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, right, who has gone to the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy, we find grace to help us in our time of need. Brothers and sisters, we have a great high priest seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making intercession on your behalf and my behalf. We have a great high priest who is waiting for us to approach his throne of grace. You need not come with guilt and shame anymore, but we come with confidence because He is for us and not against us. We come humbly to our great high priest so that we may receive mercy, find grace in time of need. And my challenge to all of us today, come and let's call on our great high priest this morning. Amen. It is better. It is different. Why? Because it is from inside out rather than outside in. Here's number two. Now we know him versus know about him. If you look at Jeremiah 31, 34 now, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. And the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. In this new covenant, the people will not just know about God through a med human mediator like Moses of old, but it will be personal, it will be intimate, and all of us will know the Lord personally and intimately. And how many of you know, when you know a person well, 
We don't even need to talk that much. We just know how the person is feeling just by observing their body language, just by hearing their tone of voice, just by feeling the vibe. Is that right? Sometimes when I come home, I could just feel it in the air. I can just feel if my wife is happy or sad just by looking at the face, just by hearing her tone of voice, just by feeling her vibe, just by being in her presence. I just know if she's happy, if she's sad, you know, whether I've upset her or if I've done something wrong, I just know it. And brothers and sisters, in our new relationship, new covenant relationship with God, it will be like this. We just know that we know when we have displeased the Lord. We know when we have done something we should not do. We just know that we know. It is that intimacy of relationship that we can have with God in the new covenant. That's why it's different. See, it, number one, it is from inside out rather than outside in. It is knowing God, not just knowing about God. And here's number three. The third difference is this. It removing versus covering. Removing versus covering. Jeremiah 31 verse 34 again. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. You see, under the old covenant, all the blood of animals can only cover over the sins of the people year after year after year. But sin was never removed at all. Why? Because the blood of animals itself are tainted with sin. But now, in the new covenant, sin is removed once and for all. Why? Because now it is washed not just by the blood of sinful animals, but it is the blood of the sinless Son of God. And when Jesus paid the penalty for our sins through His blood shed on the cross, we can now be forgiven. And the good news I have for you is this, when God forgives our sin, they are removed forever. It's not just covered over, it is removed once and for all. As far as the east is from the west, how far is the east from the west? It's infinitely far. God has chosen to remove our sins from us. And Friends, not only are they forgiven, they are also forgotten. Now, forgotten does not mean that they are wiped out of God's mind by some dementia-like action, no. But it is simply this, that God has chosen never to take our sins against us ever again. See, and that is why we can now have a clean conscience towards God in the new covenant. We know that we know there is no more shame, there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now I can truly say there is absolutely nothing between me and God. There is nothing that separates me from the love of God. And that is why, brothers and sisters, the new covenant is a better covenant founded on better promises. This new covenant is not made corporately with a people or a family like the old covenant, but it is a covenant that God made with us individually. So you are not a Christian because you are born in a Christian family, but you are a Christian because you personally believe in Jesus Christ and what He has done for you on the cross. And that's why this relationship is firsthand. It is real, authentic, and it is personal. And therefore, it can be intimate. The prophet Jeremiah told us what the new covenant is all about. But there is another prophet. His name is Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel told us how it is going to actually work. And it is, how is all this going to happen? How, how is this covenant going to turn it from uh, outside in to inside out? From just knowing about God to knowing God. From just re uh, covering over sin to, be, to actually removing sin. How is that going to work? And prophet Ezekiel told us how it works in Ezekiel 11 verses 19 and 20. Listen, this is how God's going to make it work in our life. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. That's how it's going to work. He's going to give us a new spirit. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And then they will follow my decree and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. Brothers and sisters, in the new covenant, 
um, the laws are going to be written into the hearts of the people by faith. In the Old Covenant, the laws were written on stones to be obeyed by the people on the outside. But in the New Covenant, it is now written inside into our hearts by faith. And then our hearts will be inclined to obey the Lord. Our hearts will become singular in wanting to do the will of God. And that's what um, the Ezekiel meant by God giving us an undivided heart. These hardened hearts of stone will now be changed to tender hearts of flesh and we will receive a new spirit. And it is this new spirit that will move us to obey and to keep God's laws. How is that going to happen? Ezekiel 36 elaborated on this from verse 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then he goes on to say this, and I will put my spirit in you. And that's the spirit with a capital S, which means what? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So it's not just, and once I put my spirit in you, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. My friends, that's the secret. And you notice how many times the pronoun I came up? The good news is this, in this new covenant, it is God Himself who will cleanse us and we'll be clean indeed. That is God Himself who will give us a new heart of flesh and He will put a new spirit in us. And mind you, it's not just any new spirit. It is the Holy Spirit of God Himself. It is the Holy Spirit who will then come into us, invade our life, and then move us to keep His laws. And this is how it will be done. See, it's not by might nor by power that we can now live righteously. It is by my Spirit, says the Lord. The prophet Jeremiah tells us what the new covenant is about. The prophet Ezekiel tells us how it's going to happen. It's by the Holy Spirit in us. But the prophet Isaiah also to talked about the new covenant. But what he told us is who will be the mediator of this covenant. And Isaiah's prophecy in the Old Testament concerning this mediator, who is Jesus, actually, who, who and when, when Isaiah prophesied about our mediator, Jesus Christ, it came in two parts. And these two parts seem to be contradictory. And I'll tell you why. The first part, talked to, in, the, in his first prophecy, he talked about a coming king, sovereign and supreme. And that actually fitted into the picture of the Messiah that the Jews were all waiting for. And this we find in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, where the prophet Isaiah tell us this, For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end and he will reign on David's throne, which is a fulfillment of the Davidic uh, covenant and over his kingdom, establishing, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In other words, it will surely come to pass. So what do we, what's the picture here? We see a Messiah who is coming to be king. The government will be upon his shoulder, right? And that's exactly the picture of the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. So it fitted their concept of who the Messiah will be. But in the second part of Isaiah, Isaiah begins to paint a different picture of the Messiah as a suffering saviour. How do we know this? Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 5 now. And to those of us who are in, in, the, New Test, uh, in the New Covenant, we understand this immediately. But put yourself in the shoes of the Jewish people at the time of Isaiah. And then you listen to this. Isaiah 53, verse 1 to 5. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him 
nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of sufferings, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their face, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Wow, that's such a different picture from the ruling sovereign king, isn't it? And then he goes on to say, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquity. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, we all immediately understood that to be the cross. But imagine if you are an Old Testament person listening to the prophet tell you that this is the Messiah who is coming. Someone who is acquainted with grief, despised and all of that. How confusing it must be even for the prophet Isaiah to be given these two contrasting pictures of the Messiah. A sovereign king and a suffering servant. How conflicted is that? The Jews, I tell you, right up to today, could not put these two together. In fact, some actually thought that there will be two messiahs, one who is a ruling king, the other one a suffering servant. But I tell you this, brothers and sisters, there is not two messiahs, but it's actually one messiah, but who is coming twice. The first time he came, he came to be our suffering saviour. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, He is coming back again, this time as our reigning supreme King. And this, you put the two together and we get our Saviour and King, Jesus Christ. And this is who our Messiah is. Now you put all that together. The prophet Jeremiah told us what the new covenant is all about. It is different from the Old Covenant. Why? Because it's from the inside out. It is one where our sins will be totally removed. You see, it is one where Saviour is coming. The prophet Ezekiel, however, told us how it's going to work. How is all this going to work out? It is because God is going to write the laws into our hearts and our mind and He will put a new spirit in us. What spirit is that? The Holy Spirit. And when God gives us that Holy Spirit, then we'll be inclined to actually obey and live righteously. Not because we have to, but because we want to. And then the prophet Isaiah told us who will actually bring it to pass. And it's none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, who will come to sit on the throne of David forever and ever. And together, they form this beautiful prophetic announcement of what the new covenant will look like. Okay, now we come to the second part, which is applicable to all of us. It was announced in the Old Testament, but it was accomplished in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews made it clear that the prophecy of Jeremiah in the Old Testament is actually applied to us in the New Testament. Why? Because how was this new covenant accomplished actually in the New Testament? It is recorded in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 17 to 20. Listen to this. A will or a testament or covenant, if you like, is, not, is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect uh, not without blood. You know, which means that you know, even in the Mosaic Covenant, in the Old Covenant, there was blood, the shedding of blood was involved, right? When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves or animals together with water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop, and he sprinkled the scroll and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. The Old Mosaic covenant of the law was established at Mount Sinai with the shedding of blood. Okay, after the law was given, they slaughtered the animals and the blood was sprinkled on the people, if you remember, and also uh, sprinkled at the altar and then together the people commit to keep the law. And that was how the covenant was sealed. Now, in the same way, the night before Jesus was crucified, he instituted the new covenant with his disciples. 
And we were told in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 26, listen to this, that this is what happened on the night, okay, when, when Jesus had the Last Supper. It says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Lord Jesus actually instituted the new covenant in the upper room and he sealed it with his own blood by dying on the cross. And there on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sin and we are set free from the penalty of sin and our sins are removed from us once and for all. And that's when we are set free from the penalty of sin. But that was not all. He died, he was buried, but three days later, he rose again from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And then on the day of Pentecost, our ascended Lord poured out the promised Holy Spirit upon his church. And that's when the words of the prophet Ezekiel came to pass. God put His Spirit in us on the day of Pentecost and we are set free at that moment from the power of sin. Now, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we are able to live in true righteousness. We now have the power to overcome sin. Our hearts, when the Holy Spirit came into our life, our hearts are tenderized now by the Holy Spirit and we are compelled to do God's will. It's no longer I have to do right, but I want to do right. It is by the Spirit from within. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can now live that victorious Christian life. And now what is happening is we are waiting for Jesus to come back again. And when He returns as our ruling and supreme King of Kings to sit on the throne of David, that's when we'll be set free from the presence of sin forever. What Jesus did on the cross set us free from the penalty of our sin. When He gave us the Holy Spirit, we are set free from the power of sin and we need not go on sinning. But when Jesus comes back again, we'll be set free from the presence of sin forever and sin will be removed once and for all. And brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be a new covenant believer. We are free and free indeed, free from the the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and free from the presence of sin one day. You know, I have experienced all of this in my personal life, and I want all of you to experience it too. It is such a liberating thing to be a Christian. It's not hard to be a Christian. It's liberating to be a Christian, provided we live not by our own strength, but by the Spirit. Now, let me share with you my testimony. I became a Christian at the age of 16. uh, And it was through a group of Boy Scouts who shared the gospel with me that I came to Christ. And I later reaffirmed my salvation uh, at the Billy Graham Crusade in Singapore. Now, my friends took me to their church, which happens to be a brethren church. And in that brethren church, they really tried to disciple me. But unfortunately, I was still a very carnal Christian who has so little understanding of what the Christian faith was all about. They make appointments to meet me and to to study the Bible together. I will always say yes and then never show up. I'll give them the whole run around and it was so hard to get me to be discipled. And because of that, I, I had no foundation and I very soon backslided and went back into the world until I was invited by a friend to a church there was meeting in the hotel ballroom at that time, uh, in, right in the heart of Singapore City. And I later found out that the name of the church was Calvary Charismatic Centre, pastored by Reverend Rick Seward. And when I was invited to the church, I just innocently walked into the church. And for the first time, I tell you this, I was exposed to a spirit-filled environment. I walk into a hall where I see people You know, people worshipping God like as if God was literally there. They were singing at the top of their lungs with their hands lifted in the sky. Their faces were glowing. Some of them had tears flowing down their faces as they were singing. 
And many of them were speaking in a language that I've never heard before. And they were worshipping God literally like as if God was there. And I was so taken up, you know, by the manifested presence of God in that space. And then after the worship, I was already blown away. But after the worship, there was a white-haired old lady who went up to the pulpit to preach. And I later found out that her name was Margaret Seward. And when she was preaching, it was like as if she was talking to me personally. Every word was charged, you know, with the power of God. And at the end of her sermon, I found myself walking up to the altar, weeping my way back to God. It was a real turnaround moment for me. And that one visit turned out to be a long stay of seven years. I ended up serving in the church and it was in that church for seven long years, they gave me my spiritual foundation and they helped to spiritually form me. And over those seven years, they also taught me what it means to be a follower of Christ. They taught me uh, who the Holy Spirit is. And after a few years in the church, and because I came from a brethren church, I didn't want to have anything to do with this Holy Spirit stuff. But after a few, two, three years of observing this church, I found that they were not weird. They were just passionate. They were just so filled with the, with the presence of God. And then came the day in 1981, about two years after I visited the church, when the whole church was gathered at the stadium, listening to an evangelist that they invited from America who, who talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. And while he was speaking, literally when he was still speaking, I had an Acts chapter 10 Cornelius experience. You remember, Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius was there in, the, in that meeting. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius. Right? And that was exactly what happened to me. This evangelist was still speaking and he was going on and on. But even before he finished speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon me as I was sitting up in the bleachers. And I started trembling. And then next thing I know, a language began to come out of my mouth. Words began to come out. And the moment this language started to come out of my mouth, first thing I did was I shut myself up. Because in my understanding, you cannot start to, to, to pray you know, in tongues and all that, until hands are laid upon you. So I was holding back this whole thing. I was just hanging in there until he finally finished preaching. And when he gave the altar call, I immediately ran to the front. And the moment hands came upon me, I started praying in the Spirit. I started praying in tongues and I was laughing and crying and speaking in tongues all at the same time. It was really a moment of encounter. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, it was a defining moment in my spiritual life. Now, what you may ask, what is the result of that encounter? I'll tell you what some of the results are. Firstly, I had a fresh hunger for God's Word. You know, suddenly I have this fresh hunger to read the Word of God. The Word of God, which used to be like a textbook, now it becomes like a love letter from God. I begin to see things in the Bible that I've never seen before. And this book became alive to me. I discovered that a fresh desire to pray. You see, prior to that, prayer was such a drag because, you know, it's just so hard to pray. It's not even natural in us to want to pray. Prayer was such a difficult thing. But when I was empowered with the Holy Spirit that day, you know, my prayer life just took off. You know, when I run out of words to express myself, the Holy Spirit just took over. And I now have a spiritual language that I can pray with. I have a new sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I have a greater awareness of the presence of God in worship like never before. I found a new strength, and this is one of the most important results. I found a new strength to overcome sin, to fight temptation. I was beginning to see real transformation in my character and conduct. You know, I used to be a very bad-tempered person and colourful words to come out of my mouth very easily. I get real angry really easily. But after the encounter with the Holy Spirit, something happened inside of me. You know, I, things just changed. And suddenly I found myself changing from the inside out. And it's not really a striving thing where I'm trying so hard, but it's really an inside-out experience. And since that day, I begin to experience spiritual growth and transformation. Now, it doesn't mean that I have no more ups and downs, but 
it used to be like that, really up and down, but now it's more like this. You know, there are ups and downs, but I'm making progress as I walk with God. As I allow His Word to change me, as I allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen me, I found it truly, truly life-changing. And brothers and sisters, this morning, I want you to know the same Holy Spirit is here to empower you and to help you to live in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can live no longer like old covenant people under the law, trying to keep it from the outside in. But today we have the Holy Spirit in us and we can begin to live that victorious Christian life from the inside out. And my friends, it is no longer striving, but it is trusting in God. Our great high priest is here this morning to pour out his grace that will enable you to do what your flesh is unable to do. The Holy Spirit is here to empower you so that you can forgive those who hurt you. You can love those who hate you. You can overcome sin and resist temptation. We can break free from the bondages that hold us down and we can rise above our adversity. We can defeat Satan and surrender to God. And I want to challenge you this morning. Would you come and receive, come and receive the power, the empowering, enabling of the Holy Spirit and we can live as new covenant people. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will come speak to your people and as we respond to you, would you come encounter your people in a fresh new way and minister to them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.